clothes, you have also taken another step forward. Well, we have invited our international partners, and specifically the FBI, the evidence response team. FBI joins lawyers' murder probe as report shows Kenyan police kill more people than armed robbers do. We will share uh, cooperate our intelligence with our friends in Kenya and Africa. There is need also to see how we can get to have Israel re-establish our relations with Africa. Joining forces, Israel to help Kenya fight terror. Our concern is that the government permitting fish import from China must therefore be seen as nothing less than a scheme to completely kill the fishing industry in Kenya. Storm in Kenya's lake region over fish from China, but who's to blame? And Parliament debates our ABC dialogue team members list. the 5th day of July. Hello there. Welcome to KTN Prime. I'm Linda Guto, a sign language interpreter. At the bottom end of your screen is Meresha Oweti. Let's begin this bulletin. And the Director of Criminal Investigations, Ndegwa Muhoro, says because of the complex nature of the murder of lawyer Willie Kimani and two others, four specialized crime investigation units have been put on the case. The DCI Director told the High Court in Nairobi today that the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigations would also be part of the probe. KTN's Timothy Otieno begins our bulletin tonight. The packed courtroom on Tuesday morning played host to a rare guest, one who patiently sat in the docks as the prosecution argued its case. And in doing so, my Lord, the events leading up to this moment precipitated by the abduction of three individuals, lawyer Willy Kimani, his client Joseph Mwenda, and taxi driver Joseph Mwiruri, whose bodies were retrieved from the old Donyo Sabuk River in Kilimambogo at the end of last week. Oh! Civil society groups and human rights activists piling pressure on the direction Directorate of Criminal Investigations to issue a progressive report on the status of investigations, many of whom were citing concerns that the police cannot be trusted to investigate themselves. What we are discussing here, my lord, and you will see from the interim report, there's absolutely no mention of Mr. Muhoro subjecting his report to the Independent Policing Oversight Authority. <coughs> Yet I'm sure he is very much aware of those requirements. The three killed under suspicious circumstances following their abduction on the 23rd of June. The preliminary report presented to the court by the Director of Criminal Investigations sought to assure the public that credible investigations were ongoing. My lords, we have also taken another step forward. Well, we have invited our international partners uh, specifically the FBI, the evidence response team. The report in KTN News's possession read in part, quote, owing to the complex nature of this offense, specialized crime investigation units, namely the Flying Squad, Homicide, Cybercrime, and Crime Scenes Unit have been deployed to expeditiously investigate the various aspects of this case. But it appears the prosecution was not buying that claim. There is no focus on abduction. There is no focus on those officers who may have been involved in facilitating the crime. There is no focus on any officers who may have been involved in concealing the crime. We have reached a level, my lord, where people do not have confidence in the investigations of the police. 
The prosecution's request to cross-examine Degwa Muhoro was not granted by the courts, with Justice Luka Kimaru arguing that the DCI needed time to complete investigations into the deaths. The court, however, requested Muhoro's office to present evidence to the prosecution in order to scrutinize the authenticity of the evidence obtained to ensure the investigation process was above board. The case proceeds Wednesday with a private pathologist, Dr. Andrew Gashie, hired by the Law Society of Kenya, expected to issue his post-mortem analysis before the court. A government pathologist report on Monday indicated that the victims were hit on the head with a blunt object with the taxi driver, Joseph Mwiruri, and Kimani's client strangled afterwards. Timothy Otieno, KTN News. All right, let's focus on that story by Timothy Otieno and the fact that the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigations will now be part of uh, that probe. And on our big question tonight on KTN Prime, we're asking you, do you think the entry of FBI will help Kenyans get to the truth about the police killings? Do you think the entry of FBI will help Kenyans get to the truth about the police killings? Remember, these are not the first uh, killings of this nature that are being witnessed in this country. And there's that hope that now that the FBI is involved, maybe there will be a difference. So do you think the entry of FBI will help Kenyans get to know the truth about these latest killings? Tweet us at KTN News, at KTN Kenya. Tweet me directly as well at Linda Gutu. I'll keep sampling your thoughts on this bulletin. Remember, this is a conversation that Kenyans have been having, especially on social media as well, because um, what we do know is that police officers are the prime suspects in this particular killing of a lawyer, the lawyer, and two other gentlemen. So this is a story that is being looked at from all angles in the country and there's a lot of outrage as well. So let's look at a report that has been done by IMLO, um, Independent Med Medical Legal Unit, and they're looking at the number of individuals who have been killed by the police, um, police officers in the last couple of months, in the last two or three years. So. We're looking at extrajudicial killings in the country that we have witnessed that have been reported by IMLU. So let's begin by the number w uh, with the number of people who are reported to have been killed by the police. In 2013, that number was 140, 143 people. In 2014, it went up to 199. In 2015 went down again 126 and in 2016 between January and April this year that number uh, stood at 53 so we still have a few months to go and of course everyone is crossing their fingers hoping that that number will not go up um, let's look at the nature of the killing so um, according to the report that was done by IMLU the number of summary executions in 2015 was 97 the number of people who were killed to save a life stands at 20, and the number of people who have been killed in unclear circumstances stands at 9. Just um, an illustration of uh, the reasons why some of uh, these people have been killed. Killings in uh, different counties in 2015, that is last year, Nairobi had the highest number of individuals who uh, were killed in 2015. Nairobi, 61. Nakuru, 7. Isiolo, 6. Kirinyaga, 5. Just looking at the different counties and the number of people who have been killed. Um, Turkana, Mombasa, Kwale, Kilifi, Homa Bay in 2015, the number of people who were killed stands at four. Let's look at the next board, Narok, Nyeri, and other counties as well, that number stands at three. So you can see that Nairobi has the highest number of individuals who have been killed. Um, by police, so killed using firearms in 2014, the number of people who've been killed by police, who were killed by police in 2014 was 1,254. Killed by robbers, this is another area that probably the country needs to focus on. 259 killed by unknown people, those are the unresolved cases, that number stands at 310, and those who have been killed in love triangles, we've had several stories of that kind, uh, stands at 15. So just looking at the number of people who've been, who were killed in 2014, the number of people who were tortured, IMLU also focused a little bit on this. And when you look at the postmortem report of the lawyer and the two gentlemen, you get an indication of feeling that these are individuals who were tortured before um, they were killed. So in 2014, um, the number of individuals who were tortured by regular police was 70 plus. That is 70 um, 
going upwards. Administration police tortured 10. Um, prison warders tortured 20. And that is worrying because these are men and women who are entrusted with securing uh, the security of Kenyans. And it's, it worries that these are the same individuals who are now torturing uh, Kenyans who they are supposed to protect. County officers... Um, tortured 10, chiefs and KDF also the same number, 10 plus. So you're looking at this report and uh, it worries a lot of people and that is why there's such an outcry on what is being done by the police with the latest report um, of the killing of the lawyer um, and why it's of concern and why there's a lot of pressure really on the police and uh, um, investigating officers to try and get to the bottom of this, especially putting in mind that this is a story that uh, everyone is focused on and now FBI is also involved. That's why we're asking you on our big question tonight, do you think the entry of FBI will help Kenyans get to the truth about the police killings? Let us know what you think. Tweet us at KTN News, at KTN Kenya. You can tweet me directly as well at Lindo Guto. I'll sample your views during this bulletin. Let's now focus on some diplomatic relations and Kenya and Israel have agreed to expand the scope of intelligence sharing to fight terrorism. This was announced by President Uhuru Kenyatta and visiting Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. KTN's Murimi Mwangi explains what this security deal means to Kenya. Shortly after 10.30 a.m., and Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu arrived at State House in Nairobi. On hand to receive him was the host, President Uhuru Kenyatta. Netanyahu would then receive a 21-gun salute before inspecting a guard of honor mounted by the Kenya Defense Forces. A feat which symbolically set the stage for the bilateral talks as two nations between the Netanyahu team and the Kenyan delegation led by President Uhuru Kenyatta. Although Kenya struck deals on health and agriculture. Security cooperation between Kenya and Israel, it seemed, had taken prominence in the talks. Israel, as the Prime Minister said, has faced this challenge much longer than we as a country. They're helping us uh, in, 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 in training, they're helping us uh, uh, in, in, in equipment. If you know in advance that an attack uh, is going to take place and you can preempt it and you can prevent it. That is a tremendous and direct assistance to the saving of lives. Right over wrong. Netanyahu is the first sitting Israeli Prime Minister to visit Sub-Saharan Africa in 30 years. His visit coming at a time when the global networks of terrorism have struck mercilessly at the African continent. The two leaders agreed to expand the scope of intelligence sharing, while President Kenyatta sought Israel's help to tackle cybercrime. Israel is doing this um, across a very wide canvas, uh, and we, are, we will share, uh, cooperate our intelligence with our friends in Kenya and Africa. At the State House function, Netanyahu sentimentally recounted the dramatic details of 4th of July 1976 when his elder brother, Jonathan Netanyahu, then a soldier, was killed during a hostage rescue mission in Uganda. Our pilots landed here afterwards, and in retrospect, we know that this was not merely an act to save innocent Israeli hostages, but it was an act dealt a, a devastating blow to international terror at the time. As a country, we also paid the price for many of our people who were subsequently killed in Uganda by Idi Amin as a result of the support that we gave. But with the leader of the Middle East superpower in town, security was enhanced around the city while well, most highways in Westlands and Museum Hill were closed in the morning hours as the Netanyahu convoy proceeded to State House. Israel is coming back to Africa, and Africa is coming back to Israel. Thank you very much.
And so after the maiden visit by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, now begins the wait for Kenyans to enjoy the goodies unleashed by the two leaders on the eve of this historic visit by a sitting Israeli Prime Minister. Muremi Mwangi KTN News at State House in Nairobi. So the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu did not visit the Galana Kulalu model irrigation farm contrary to expectations. This was attributed to his busy schedule in the region. However, the future of the model farm remains a key benchmark of the benefits of the Kenya-Israel cooperation. Our special correspondent Alex Jamwada has been following developments on the Galana project. It is about three years now since the Galana Kulalu model farm was launched as a precursor to a million acre food security irrigation program across Kenya. It has had some technical and managerial challenges, but the Israeli government that is funding the project to the tune of 7.2 billion shillings remains supportive with technology and skills transfer being a key component of the partnership between the two countries. You know, Israel is a small country. Uh, it was founded without any natural resources. The only natural resource we had was our, our brain and our heart. And we, we've learned to do a lot, to do more with less. Israel earlier this year agreed to increase the number of students that they will train, especially in the agricultural and irrigation initiative from 30 to 45. After their joint press conference at State House Nairobi, the Israeli Prime Minister and President Uhuru Kenyatta flagged off 117 Kenyan students to Israel to learn dry land technology in agriculture and water management. During his visit to Israel in February this year, President Kenyatta toured Kibbutz Farm where high-tech dairy farming and irrigation technology are at their peak. Back home, the Israeli company that is managing the Galana Kulalu model farm, Green Arava, is expected to hand over the farm to the Kenyan government in March next year. What we plan to do is bring in the private sector to run this farm and start kick off the second phase, which is expanding this farm to 30,000 acres, which is manageable using the water available from the river. Um, beyond that, beyond 30,000, we'll need to invest in a dam. The project's cost was scaled down from 14 billion shillings to 7.2 billion after the National Assembly Committee on Agriculture recommended that certain components like a milling farm be removed. The committee also gave the project a go ahead after it was clarified that this is only a test farm to pick top three best yielding varieties and it was premature to make conclusions basing on the 10 bags per acre average that had been given. We are still looking at the average of about uh, 30 bags per acre. In the first harvest, 16 varieties were under test with the top variety yielding 39 bags per acre. Alex Chamwada for KTN News. Let's not focus on our Muslim brothers and sisters. The chief Qadi, Sheikh Sharif Mohdar, has announced the end of the Muslim fasting month of Ramadan after the moon was sighted. He said tomorrow will be the first day of the Eid celebrations that will continue for four days. <laughs> kwa leo mwezi umeonekana sehemu tofauti tofauti za hapa Kenya na Tanzania Somalia paka Comoro Islands pia tumepata habari kwa mwezi umeonekana uh, Wajir in fact ndio watu wa kwanza wametuelezea na kadhi wa Wajir Sheikh Mursal ndio ametuarifu hivyo kwa hivyo tuna tumeconfirm mwezi umeonekana na tuna declare kesho uh, Jumatano tarehe 6 uh, July 2016 
Right. The revelation that Chinese fish has found its way into Kisumu, despite the region being home to Lake Victoria, has kicked up a storm. Leaders from the Lake region have condemned the importation, terming it a threat to the economy of the region. Fishmongers are, however, saying falling fish stocks in Lake Victoria has a lot to do with the importation saga. Rashid Ronald reports. <laughs> Seventy-eight years old, Joseph Ndati from Dunga Beach in Kisumu, a retired fisherman having traversed the expansive lake searching for fish during his heydays. He has a rich story of fishing in Lake Victoria. Wakati ile hatu kikuja na supria ilo mepiko ugali. Unaweka tundani ya maji. Na unapata samaki imeingia hapo ndani. Unatoa. Unaenda nae. Unaenda kupika. Hatu kikuja na ndowani. Kidogo tu. Na ugali ukiweka kwa mdomo yake. Unapata samaki ina, ina nini? Inasika samaki sayo sayo. Tena samaki mnono mnono. Experts and fishermen say the catch is getting smaller each day. And the fish stocks in the lake are dwindling day by day. Thanks to human activities on the lake. Kila kitu inaelekezwa kwa lake. Pollution ina, 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 ina leto na these factories. Na industries ndio inaleta pollution na basana. Lakini mweti mutu tu waka waida wezi pollute, maji atai pollute na nini. Hakuna. Ni factories, senye inajulikana, factory ni hii na hii na hii, kila kitu nye wapiga, inanda direct kwa lake. The government has its share of blame too. Ati samaki inatoka China, inakuja hapa inauzwa. Na sisi tuko na bahari. Inatoka aje, kukuja hapa na hii bahari, inafuanya nini? Na sirikala wezi kulinda hii bahari. Critics are not surprised by the ever-increasing prices of fish in Kisumu, let alone the importation of that commodity from China. Indeed, business is booming here at the East African Seafoods in Kisumu. The company are the center of the importation of fish from China. So the size here China at least bein na fu. Eh, atena watu wa meipenda haina nini nyingi sana. Aina madara nyingi sana. Hii samaki hii miezi mbili nimesaa kula kwa mwezi. Bei yake iko chini tena ni tamu. Mimi napongeza mwenye ameleta hii samaki Kisumu. However, leaders from the region strongly condemned the importation. Apart from questioning the safety of the imported fish, they also claim that it's aimed at marginalizing the communities living around Lake Victoria. Our concern is that the government permitting fish import from China must therefore be seen as nothing less than a scheme to completely kill the fishing industry in Kenya in total disregard of the livelihoods being put at risk and possibilities of serious job losses for our fisher folk. And as the debate continued, I decided to take a walk to Luangni Beach here in Kisumu. They call it the home of fish once you are in this place. And I'm told all the fish that is eaten here is made in Lake Victoria. And if you like it, made in Kenya and not made in China. Rashid Ronald, KTN News, Luangni Beach in the county of Kisumu. Luangni Beach, if you only knew what the meaning of Luangni is, trust me, I doubt many of you would eat fish from there. Well, this next story may be some good news for Kenyan men who would like to get circumcised but fear the pain associated with the procedure. The National AIDS and STI Control Program is in the process of rolling out a painless and bloodless circumcision procedure in an effort to further encourage voluntary medical male circumcision. Our in-house Dr. Masi Korir has that report for you. The male circumcision practice in Kenya may just gain a new face from what we are traditionally used to. NASCO plans to roll out a new procedure using a medical device called Prepex. This is a simple way to help overcome challenges like pain and disruption of work activities usually associated with the normal surgical procedure. <laughs> <laughs> the 
This new method also ensures the neat outcome of the circumcision by eliminating human interventional errors. The World Health Organization pre-qualified medical device is said to be cost-effective with a high acceptability rate of at least 9 in 10 men. The things that keep men away from the circumcision is the fear of pain. So what we have done is to invest in developing new circumcision devices which gives the benefit of lesser pain. The way it works is that it's applied to an eligible male uh, penis and the rubber band is left in place for seven days. There's no cutting. So what it does is it cuts off the blood supply um, for the foreskin, which we call the prepuce, and then it falls off after seven days. With a successful pilot phase, NASCO plans to roll out this method in priority counties of Kisumu, Siaya, Migori, Homa Bay, Kericho, Turkana, West Pokot, parts of Nairobi, and Mombasa. <laughs> Dr. Masi Korir, KTN News. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has reminded East Africans about the much talked about hostage rescue mission in Uganda in 1976 in which his brother was killed. When Operation Thunderbolt happened on the 4th of July 1976 in Entebbe, Uganda, Kenya's involvement was a heavily guarded secret. It remained so for decades, especially for the 18 GSU commanders who played an important role helping the Israeli commanders and hostages on transit through JKIA. KTN's Dorka Swangira sat down with one of those commanders. Here's the story of Elijah Gashiri Kabubu. 4th July 1976 in Tebe, Uganda. The most important 90 minutes of history were played out in the Operation Thunderbolt. 102 hostages were rescued. Five Israeli commandos left wounded and the unit commander, Lieutenant Colonel Yonatan Netanyahu, the older brother of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, was killed, just as all the hijackers, three hostages and 45 Ugandan soldiers. But the rescue plan would not have happened without Kenya's help. The General Service Unit then was a powerful paramilitary force. 1st July 1976, under the police commandant Ben Gethy, 18 GSU commandos were selected, the best and most disciplined shooters. Elijah Gishori Kabubu, Corporal Number 28242, was in the GSU Company 16th Platoon, drafted two years earlier. They were trained extensively and practiced house shooting. We never knew what we were being selected for. It was only two people who knew about the operation, Jomo Kenyatta and Ben Gethi and the Blue Ma Blues Mackenzie. On the 4th of July, armed with four guns, two pistols, an AK-47 and rocket propellers, they kept vigil waiting for the planes that would follow Israeli aircraft that had previously landed ferrying doctors. At around midnight, more planes came from Entebbe ferrying the commandos and the rescued hostages. The planes were refueled, the injured treated. The GSU secured the airport. For every one plane, there were three GSU officers to cordon it off. At the same time, another is Israeli plane cast light above the secret mission. Kabubu was in charge of transporting five wounded Israeli commandos and hostages from the AC Hercules 130 plane to the passenger plane with doctors. The operation, we finished about two, one and a half or two hours and all the soldiers of Israel came out. They were sharing for 18 of us. And we were told, whatever you have seen or you have heard the highest government secret. Because you have done a good job, you shall be rewarded, which we have never seen even today, even this minute. <laughs> In 1978, Jomo Kenyatta decided that selected GSU commandos would be trained in Israel to handle growing global security threats. Kabubu was chosen, but when he returned as a bomb and gun expert, Kenyatta died. And then he was assigned to the presidential escort service, guarding President Moi, his deputy Moai Kibaki, and the Attorney General Charles Njonjo. Later, he was appointed as a bodyguard to Ben Gethy. Were you happy now that you had been trained as a commando, then you came back to become a bodyguard? No, no, no. We had feared him because he was strictly of security. 
Because I was at, uh, at, uh, at uh, Georgia's, whom we loved very much by then. Kenya would pay the price for helping Israel. May 24, 1978, Bruce McKenzie, then agriculture minister, was assassinated. A bomb was attached to his aircraft and it exploded. The Norfolk Hotel, owned by a prominent member of the Jewish community, was bombed on the 31st December 1980. The ESU was a paramilitary, and if they are well equipped, they were equipped before they could be a very good. Detained in Naivasha, 1995, for a month over the Mwakenya saga, he feared that his expertise in guns inspired a fear in powerful circles. He resigned from the force in 1996. Now, at 61, the father of four works as a decorated security consultant manager. Would it be enough just for people to know that when this happened, that you had been there and you played an important role? It had comes from many from, from the people's heart. The president himself recognized me that I did a lot to change this country. Because the, the, the worst Dolokas is uh, at last they detained me. This is a story that has been told to many generations in movies, in documentaries, in films. And the Kenyan part has been left out. And not so many people know about it. Been secret all those years, 40 years. Nature now have realized that, and even Uganda, that's why he's here, to, to, to make that Uganda to realize they were not attacked because of, of, of Ugandans. They were attacked because of the bad leadership, which could put them in more problem. Dorka Swangira, KTN News, Nairobi. Thank you so much for keeping it KTN News. Time for business now. My name is Joy Doreen Bira. With just 15 days to go to the biennial Brookside Livestock Breeders Show, NCL this year's show promises to be bigger and better than before. Over 100 exhibitors and stakeholders from all over the world are expected to converge to deliver a show that promises to be not only extremely thrilling, but also very informative. KTN's Phil Kitani reports. With the livestock sector contributing over 10% of the national gross domestic product and 40% of the agricultural GDP, the Brookside Livestock Breeders Show and Sell, set to take place between the 21st and the 23rd of July, is expected to set the pace and position the sector as the next big thing to invest in. But rather than sell it as a fad, the aim is to encourage young Kenyans to venture into agriculture as a business and thus drive gainful employment for the youth. I encourage the young farmers like myself and even those who are younger than me, if I'm, I'm looking a bit older now, um, to come and you'll learn a lot and you'll also see other young farmers will be showcasing their own animals as, um, uh, as uh, the exhibits that will be here for, for competition as well. The Breeder Show is one of the largest convergence of stakeholders in the livestock sector in Africa with the main aim of stimulating trade in livestock and livestock products in the country and beyond facilitating technology and knowledge transfer. The event brings together producers, processors, and traders of livestock and livestock products and suppliers of technology solutions and services across the entire value chain. Anyone who wants to see what is ideal or best practice uh, in livestock husbandry, uh, this is the place to be. The three-day event is organized by the Brookside Dairy Limited in collaboration with other stakeholders in the livestock and dairy industry. We are expecting at least 100 trade exhibitors. We haven't uh, filtered that number yet, but uh, people are booking and paying every day. Today, the organizers of the show received several checks from different sponsors, including Pembe Flour Mill and Unga Limited. The organizers are expecting to mop up up to 50 million shillings for the show, with some of the money going to reward the various winners in several categories. Philip Keitang, KTN News. Remittance inflows to Kenya increased by 2.3% in May of 2016 compared with 1.7% growth in April of 2016. Cumulative inflows in the 12 months to May of 2016 increased by 11.1% to 163.6 billion shillings from 147.2 billion shillings in the year to May 2015. The 12-month average flow to May 2016 increased to 13.63 billion shillings from 12.27 billion shillings according to the Central 
Central Bank, a sustained upward trend in part reflects the entry of additional money remittance providers into the market. Central Bank adds that remittance inflows from Europe increased by 14.8% and accounted for 31.8% of total inflows in May of 2016. Inflows from the rest of the world also increased by 2%, while those from North America decreased by 4.7%. Equatorial Commercial Bank, ECB, has rebranded to Spire Bank as it announced plans to restructure its operations to meet new business requirements and aid the organization in strategically positioning itself for future growth. As part of the restructuring, uh, Spire Bank plans to review operations of its business units to deliver business value and also increase their efficiency as it targets to move from the Tier 3 to Tier 2 in five years. Kiti and Zabiagina had a sit-down with the bank's chief executive, team on the significance of the rebrand from a bottom line perspective. Um, the rebranding has been advised by three distinct things. One is that um, we feel stronger and safer for in the life of a new shareholder uh, in the name of Mualimu National. Mualimu National And Spire Bank uh, is actually looking to focus on small and medium enterprises to help them uh, improve their businesses. Now, away from that, uh, bank chief executives meeting under the umbrella body, the Kenya Bankers Association, have called on the judiciary to speed up the settlement of court cases if the business community is to have confidence in the judiciary as well as boost investor sentiments. At least 10 billion shillings is currently locked up in court litigation cases, a scenario that has seen investors investors lose billions of shillings. In the same breath, banks have welcomed central bank's move to audit bank ICT systems, noting that this would boost investor and customer confidence. Apart from the normal audit, um, central bank ordered an audit of the ICT system and of course inside the lending. Now what is this going to do is going to level the ground so that from a governance point of view, the ground is leveled. You as a customer, you not be worried whether this bank is, is big or small in so long as you are sure of the governance structures. Okay. And this is the right move. Probably should have happened a long time ago. And, and this will ensure that now banks will be on a takeoff because the issues of where um, directors connive to do one or two things, they'll be a matter of the past. Career Development Valley Development Authority, KVDA, has launched new packages for the acacia organic honey that attracted international interest during the 2013 brand Kenya showcasing uh, in Netherlands. The launch will now see honey produced in the Rift Valley consumed in airlines flying all over the world. During the launch in Eldoret, Kerio Valley Development Authority Managing Director David Kimosop said the new 20 and 150 grams packages are tailor-made for airlines, hospitals and the hotel industry, explaining that previous packs did not address the needs of the lucrative industry due to their bulky nature. This should lead the way in establishing NOREP as an economic block is so that we can get a platform for showcasing um, unique products that are found in Notre Dame, like this acacia honey. Through its extensive plan to increase honey production in North Rift, Kerio Valley Development Authority has been engaging farmers from the semi and arid land counties like West Pokot, Baringo Samburu and Elgeo Maraquet, where acacia trees are the main vegetation, value addition is helping the farmers target the market more aggressively. I want to assure Kenyans and the public is that the honey that KVDA puts in the market is 100% organic, it's natural, and it's medicinal. It's not mixed with anything else. So if you want to save honey and you want to remove the doubt that's in the market today, 
The honey is classified and named according to its composition and the authority has been processing over 700 tons annually both for the local and international market. Eldoret International Airport Manager Peter Wafula said the packaging of honey meets international airline safety standards. For the farmers themselves, the new packaging means that their product is well on the way to consumption on a global scale. Ashley Mazuri, KTN Business. Interesting story there. Now, among other business stories, Safaricom today also launched Little Cab to rival, uh, that is the take app company Uber. But will it make it in the market? We also have Taxify that is also trying to rival Uber. So I guess it's now technology driving businesses today. And that marks the end of our business tonight. My name is Joy Doreen Bira. For more, log on to our website, ktnews.com. That is the focus on the murder of lawyer Willie Kimani and two other gentlemen. Um, that was our big question tonight. Let's uh, take a look at what some of you had to say. Ethan Bauer says, game of musical chairs meant to call public anger. Uh, Muafanki Wajir says, yes, involving FBI on the investigations will amount to a lot of findings, but my worry remains on the end results. Ben Mugavana finally says, remember Father Kaiser? FBI hit a stone wall. They won't unravel anything. Some of your feedback on our big question tonight, whether or not you think the FBI, the entry of FBI into this whole mystery will help Kenyans get to know the truth. You can look at our Twitter handle at KTN News at KTN Kenya just to get to pick the minds of uh, Kenyans on the big question. That's where we leave it on KTN Prime. On behalf of Maresha Witi and I, thank you so much for watching. For those of you on KTN News, the last word begins right now with uh, Sophia Wanuna and she takes this conversation further. The murder of lawyer Willie Kimani and asking the pertinent questions that need to be asked. Will justice ever be served? Will justice be seen to be served in this particular case, even with involvement of FBI? Have a good night.